and the NVA had come up that knoll in the jungle. And in the first hour of firefight, we never saw one person. They would come out and open fire. We blown back into the jungle, back into the jungle. We didn't see anything until maybe after a couple hours of this firefight. And we finally made contact and we could see like a little hill. Well, they were all dead bodies. And the NVA were coming back and stacking up the dead bodies because they wanted to get on top of the dead to shoot down better at us. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of John Stryker Meyer, a pioneer in the special ops community who served two tours as a MACV SOG operator and team leader in Vietnam. John led small covert spike teams across the fence on clandestine operations in the Laos and Cambodia in what many now refer to as the secret war in the Vietnam conflict. John has three books that chronicle both his stories and those of his fellow SOG operators, has been featured in various interviews, including several with Jocko Willink, and is currently building his own podcast with Jocko to tell the stories of other members of the SOG community. John and Jocko are also collaborating on a video game based on SOG missions. It's amazing John lived through the experiences you're about to hear, and I hope you enjoy his stories as much as I did. John, welcome to the show, and thanks for being willing to share your story. Oh, thank you, Ryan. An honor to be here. I got to say, I, um, I've interviewed a bunch of what I think I would call more modern-day uh, warriors now, Tom Satterley, Todd Opalski, Tom Shea, these guys who are SEALs, Delta, and Rangers. Oh, and sure. after having after having read across the fence, your your book, your account of your time in Vietnam, I would imagine if any of them were here to share, they'd say that's like another level of crazy beyond what they'd seen. <laughs> Similar to what Jocko said, in fact. <laughs> but uh, I I question how you're even here today after reading some of these stories. So I'm very eager to dive into this experience you shared. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know what? I, I'm, when I hear people like Jocko say that, even I'm amazed. Yeah. Yes, it's, sir. It's another level of crazy that uh, it's hard to understand, but the book is so well written, so much detail. You really understand the characters. So I, I'd like to dive in. And one of the things that I noticed in the book, John, that you mentioned is eventually you kind of gravitate towards or become... Um, almost addicted to the adrenaline, the intensity of these missions. And I'm curious when you were growing up, was that something that you grew up with? Like risk, risk taker, <laughs> more adventurous, or did, was that just developed over time in the army? Um, that's a good question. Um, I have to think about that. When I was a kid, you know, we, um, we always liked playing sports, riding bikes, and then pushing things a little bit just to see what you can get away with, you know? particularly in the teenager years, but I never thought about it in that context. That's a great question. So can we, uh, what to come back to that? May I have yeah. an answer within an hour or so at the first hour block? <laughs> no, hey, it's no problem. <laughs> no, I, I, I guess in, in all honesty, I mean, seriously, I, I, I never thought about that way. And I don't think it's um, something that's a major risk factor. I've always like enjoyed pushing things. Look, if you had a bike, you want to go as fast as you could roller skates as fast as you could, things like that. And then um, once I read the book, The Green Berets, then it's like, oh, the, the Air Force recruiter told me I couldn't fly airplanes because I had a, an eye thing. So I said, okay, well, then I could jump out of airplanes. That's next. Was that, was that actually your, your goal was to fly at first? Oh, yeah. Um, when I grew up, that's all I had was model airplanes. No, no. And, and cowboys, you know, you had the plastic cowboy figures. So when you had an earache, be in bed all day, my mom would bring in the horses and the cowboys and the, the bad and the good and things like that. And there was something about that that made you want to fly or just <laughs> or, or surf? Well, my uncle had uh, she he flew um, Goonie Birds over the hump during World War Two. Wow. I'm not sure for how long, but I know he served there and I always had his. Um, his unit insignia patch, which I kept for years. And uh, somewhere along the line, it disappeared on me. 
But um, yeah, the flying and jets, you know, remember as a kid um, hearing about Chuck Yeager. And then um, when we were in school, I forget if it was elementary school or our first year at junior high school, which in my case, we're still talking in the 50s, like late 50s. Yeah. They had people that came by talking about the Air Force. And they said they had a miniature jet engine. And they had it on a very heavy cement block of some sort that weighed like over 100 pounds or a steel block. They said this engine is a miniature, but it's so powerful. We we want to show you what it sounds like. And the power is like, it was fascinating. Here's this guy as he cranks up this miniature jet engine. It roared like like a tiger. And uh, it was fascinating. So I used to make all the, whatever the latest Air Force fast jet was. I had the uh, jet, a couple of rockets, but they were they just weren't as much fun as the jets. And then you mentioned you talked to the Air Force recruiter. Was that something like you you actually went to them and said, "Hey, I want to go fly." They checked your eyesight out, and and then it was a no. Well, you know, I I so somewhere I I wore glasses for a while. And somewhere during that time with the eye exams, I remember talking to the doctor and we were talking back and forth. And I just said, you know, someday I want to fly jets. He says, forget about it. With your wow. eyes, they'll never let you in because I have a dominant eye and a lazy eye. And so the lazy eye is the leg and the right eye is my airborne eye. <laughs> oh, just, it seems like that never even phased you, but was that like a, a blow to you you've been wanting to be a pilot and then all of a sudden somebody said hey that's probably not going to happen yeah it was around ninth to tenth grade you know because uh ninth grade was traumatic for me because i had um um i was pitching in ninth grade at junior high school and we had exhibition games with the high school kids and our junior high school team beat the high school and again <laughs> it was jv not not the varsity okay, you know I mean? okay yeah. it was jv but they're bigger but myself or another pitcher, we were just smoking them. And then I hurt my arm, just fooling around with my buddy and was never the same. And the, my baseball career, which I dreamed about from age two all the way through. And then the Air Force thing was like a backup. So within by ninth grade, it's like, oh, my God. What's all next? Is like falling apart here. Uh, um, did you, John, did you come from a military family? You mentioned your uncle. W- was there anybody else that in your family that kind of influenced you into the military or was it something you just picked up from what you just described? In in all honesty, it was just something I picked up. Um, You know, we had um, over the years uh, watched all those World War II movies. You know, you just saw the history and saw what the aviators did during World War II you know 12 o'clock high all those kind of movies yeah and of course there's a couple of john wayne movies along the way that um, um just talked about the patriotism and the extreme sacrifice of our warriors and it was kind of like oh my god they did that was the big war and then the korean war pork chop hill and uh then later learning about the chosan reservoir it was like oh my god yeah you know so like I said, when I, it took me two years to flunk out of college. So I flunked out. Dad goes, you know, they're coming for you. And uh, right around that time, I was working in Yosemite, and I read the book, The Green Berets. I said, that's it. If I go, I want to go with these guys. Because at that time, you, know, you had basic training, advanced infantry. You had a month leave, and you're in Vietnam. And I'm a city slicker. You know, like Clint Eastwood says, it's important to know your weaknesses or your limitations, I guess. So I knew I was limited and uh, needed all the training I could get. So with the SF route, got some extra training. Got it. So I want to ask you one other thing. You touched on it just now, actually. Um, The Korean War. So oftentimes we hear a lot of people talk, obviously, about World War II. Even in your book, I think you describe one of your your peers who I think father was in like Battle of the Bulge, for instance. And and it's always there. Johnny McIntyre. Yeah, his dad got a silver star at the battle. Crazy, that's just crazy, right? So, like, you always hear about that. You rarely hear about the Korean War. How did that influence you, if at all? You mentioned like reading about it or hearing about it. Um, Well, what was that like for you? Well, you know, it was like, man, that's a. I'm I'm glad I missed that war. It's brutal, and and that movie Pork Chop Hill, and there was another Korean War movie that I saw. 
because the, um, in our day, I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, and we used to get the, a, a TV station out of New York, KOR, Channel 9. And on Saturdays, they would have war movies. And when we were kids, when it was raining out, then we'd be in front of the TV and, you know, just watch the war movies. And over time, you know, everything from the Submariners to the John Wayne movie for even the, the Seabees. Yeah. They came away with a deep appreciation. I mean, uh, it's like any vet who sees a movie that Hollywood made about them, they go, that's lousy. It stinks. It was wrong. They should have done this. They should have done that. Well, okay. But for a city slicker who never knew nothing about nothing other than history books, which are <laughs> dull and boring, I mean, it's one thing to read about a battle of Antietam words, 20,000 Union soldiers are killed and 19,000 confederate. Okay, that's that's bad. Must have been a lot of dead bodies around. Okay, what's for dinner tonight? Yeah. But seeing these movies on that, that it kind of turned it up a couple of notches in terms of tuning you into the reality of it all, you know? Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Gosh. So then, fast forwarding, you mentioned you're at Yosemite. You read, uh, you read the Green Beret book. Yeah. Um, By Robin Moore. Yeah. Where, where did you go after, like how long after that are you signing up? Where did you go to sign up? Was it well, outside it was of Yosemite it or was what? It was a summer job. When I got done, I came back. I tried a junior college just to dodge for a couple more months. Right. It's like, I'm still in transient. Hadn't <laughs> talked to the recruiters yet. So I'm in a French class in a junior college as a third or fourth week. And I avoided answering any questions so finally the teacher answered me a question which required a yes no answer i said c <laughs> in my french class and i said mm, maybe it's time to hang this up and let's go face the reality so i went down to the recruiter signed up and then the rest is history from there all right yeah if you can in the book it's really interesting how you kind of talk about the truly how quickly you move from from one training event to the next and you're in country and you do some training. Could you just step through some of that briefly to give context of how quickly you're in country truly and starting operations? Well, actually it was it, from the day that I enlisted to the day I actually put my boots on the ground and, uh, in Cameron Bay, and it was gosh, 14, 16 months. Cause the December 1st, I was, I enlisted, went in, Oh, I listed. Then I went into the army on December 1st or 2nd, 66. Yep. Basic training of Fort Dix, advanced infantry training, Fort Gordon, May of 67, jump school. From there, right up to special forces training. And then me, Johnny McIntyre, a few other guys got recycled in the Camo MOS training, yeah. which included Morse code. And I had a 10 year. And, um, you know, and remember the name of Sergeant Villa Rosa. He came in on the weekends and worked with us. He taught us at night on his own time to help us get through. He said, you guys can do it. You just got to practice. We did. So we got through it. Um, we graduated, got the certificate of graduation around about December 20th, 67. Go home for Christmas. We had to go TDY to Fort Gordon for three months on an RTT training. During which time, Johnny Mac and I were proudly busted to private, E-Deuce. <laughs> land in Vietnam in April, go through the in-country. Now, so we landed mm -hmm. at the end of April, go through the in-country training for two or three weeks. And there was maybe a little downtime there. I just forget. But anyway, we went, um, and they told us at Bragg, at the end of your in-country training, some little guy's going to come out and say, we're looking for volunteers for a project. Do not do it. Okay. So Johnny Mac and I are there, and we just saw the movie, The Green Berets with John Wayne. What, are you kidding me? Johnny Mac goes, what's the project, Sergeant? And he goes, forget it. Either you're in or you're out. So we signed up right there. We volunteered. Next day, we're up in the Da Nang. That's where we got the briefing, the top secret briefing. So, so actually, could you, could you just share the atmospherics of the briefing where you're, you're in country and they're like, hey, who wants to volunteer for this? Because it's really well described in the book. You kind of got this audience of folks, and then they they describe this other operation or lifestyle yeah. you could have. Could you just talk about that briefly? Because I found that to be super well, interesting. Well, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's quick. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, because it reminded me of a way when I was in, when I was going through advanced infantry training, there was a day, a rainy day. We're in an auditorium where we're 500, 600 people. We're all sitting on the floor and you had different people coming in for MOS. You know, guys coming in for signal from military police. The cooks would come in and go, you're never going to be hungry. This would be the, you'll, you'll really love working as a cook. It's the best job in the army. And they had a stage where you had the steps on each side and all these legs would go up the steps and talk about it. It was like boring. We took a break, came back. I think it was the second session right near the end, right before lunch. And they said, Oh, we got one more recruiter. And in walks this little banny rooster of a green beret. It was raining. Now he had his beret on, he had fatigues, didn't even have a fatigue jacket, walked in, did a vertical jump to the stage, turned around and says, we're looking for recruits with special forces. Anybody interested? I jumped up off the floor. I read the book. I'm ready. <laughs> I figured everybody would stand up and go, yeah, let's do it. Me and two or three other guys yeah. out of five or 600. That's like, so that's, that's on a smaller scale at the end of our uh, in-country training. That's what happened. I forget the exact room, but there was, you know, there had to be 50 or 60 of us in there. God. And I, I can't even tell you who came out, but it, it came out with that. We got a project. I'm going, wow, Sergeant Villa Rosa was right. And those guys, you know, we had Sergeant Wagner and Sergeant Graham. These guys really knew what they're talking about. And then right there, you just realize everything in your life just changed. Next day, we're up there at Da Nang. They took us to a safe house. And you need to talk about culture shock. And so we go to the safe house that night. And there were guys either from Project Delta or from Mike Force. They are just came back from a mission in the Ashaw Valley where they were relieving one of our units or something. But they were talking about all the combat. So McIntyre and I are sitting there drinking our Cokes because we're too afraid to drink alcohol. And... Um, we're hearing these guys talk and we're like going, holy shit, this is like the real war. And then the next day we go up for our, for our um, briefing. And that's where we had that whole scene where we go in, we take out our pads and pencils like good little students, like we've been for the last 16 months. And the first thing the Sergeant Major says, put that shit away. This is a top secret briefing. And he said, uh, before we use one piece of paper, 20 years, either you're in or you're out. If you don't want to, if you don't want to stay in this project, you can leave now. Well, nobody left. We all signed up. And the the 20 years was 20 years of secrecy. Is that right? John? Yeah, you couldn't talk yeah. about it. Like you said, you can't tell your mother, your girlfriend, or anybody. So and, yeah. Uh, I said, and you don't don't put it in your letters. If you do, we'll find out. You know, on the side bro on that, after my first book came out, my dad said to me, now I know why this black guy would come by and pick up our trash. Stop. At their house in Trenton. They had a guy from the FBI and, and dad got a job at the post office because he had been a milkman all his life. And the bottom was beginning to fall out of it. So he got out of it when he could. And then he got this job at the post office where my uncle was working. And he saw that black guy there and the FBI office was up on the second floor. He says, those guys came by your, now I know why they picked up your trash. <laughs> <laughs> so just quickly, you mentioned yeah. leg, obviously for those who are listening, who aren't familiar, leg is somebody who's not airborne qualified, right? So I, it's Indeed. come up before. Indeed. Um, <laughs> and then you also said something interesting where that decision changed your life, which clearly it did, right? Yeah. I mean, you went and did things that most people won't even dream of. Did you realize it at the time? I mean, how old were you then? Were you... 19 well, no, uh, this was uh, 68 so I um 68 22 22 okay so you're 22 did could you kind of sense like all right my life is going to go on a different trajectory because I'm making this I, I'm volunteering on this one yeah we knew it was different but I mean, how do you know how dramatically no. different it was going to be I mean we'd heard but during that in-country training we talked to God we had trainers some of them were all banged up and cast or crutches because they had been wounded, but they were part of the in-country training as they recuperated. So we heard about the aid camps and you heard about Langvey. 
Heck, Johnny McIntyre and I were in a bar in Washington, D.C. when Lang Vang got overrun with tanks. The first time the NBA used tanks. And we're going like, we're going to die. We went to the bank, took out all our money and spent it before we went to Vietnam. We didn't want our families fighting over our vast fortunes, you know. And uh, <laughs> so that was it. I mean, so we knew that this, when they wanted to fight, and of course, Quezon was on the front page every day. Now, what they didn't tell you was the Marines were there, but Green Berets were the FOB3 at Quezon running missions. And you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned A camps. You mentioned this uh, this scene with you and and McIntyre taking your money out and uh, buying steak dinners, which is just such a. <laughs> it's just like I think a lot of vets could re- relate to that. Like, all right, let, I want to make sure I live it up before I head over there. So Here we go. Just, like some things never change. Um, <laughs> but the A camps. But just before we jump into that, if you could yep. share, you you kind of talk about the top secret briefing. Is that the first time you're kind of brought into the fold for SOG and CNC and what you're? Oh yeah, um, going mean, to be exposed to. At all. I mean, of course, you know, it's like several other guys have written in the books. There was a a black curtain across the map. So there's the introductions. Sign it. He re-explained one more time. He said, Okay, now you're in the secret war. Welcome to the secret war. This is what it's about. Bloop, the curtain comes off. There's South Vietnam with all the cities, but then there's Laos and Cambodia. And Laos north with, with these 10 by 10 squares of targets. It's like, ooh, that's interesting. And everything from that day on, it was just, welcome to the twilight zone. And so truly, that's when you are indoctrinated into what everybody knows is Mac V SOC, right? Yes, sir. M- Military Assistance Command, Vietnam Studies and Observation Group, which is a great name, and then CNC in particular within that. Yeah, w- w- you know, funny within our ranks, we always said CNC, Command and Control, stuff like that. We seldom talked about SOC, but it was studies and observations. They did it that way because initially it was Special Operations Group, but our entire budget was in the Navy budget. And they changed it to studies and observations because they knew that reporters always look for that stuff, you know? Yeah. So when a smart ass reporter comes along, studies and observations, oh man, give me the That's good boring. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's boring. It's great. And it worked. <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. Yeah, me too. So you're you're kind of you get this briefing, you come out. How long is it between the time you receive that briefing and the first time you're on a combat operation? Before we jump into the op, I'm just trying to get an understanding of how long between some time somebody has said, hey, this is what's really going on, and then you're actually in it? Well, don't forget my introduction. I mean, the real introduction, the blood curdling gut check was the day we arrived at Fubai. I mean, you know, you forget yeah. about the helicopter ride where we're introduced, like Jocko brought this out, and I never thought about it until we had talked about it with Jocko, but we had that flight. It was on the South Vietnamese Air Force, an old age 34. Well, all the footage we had seen, helicopters were all you. He said, what are we doing with this old bird? And uh, so that was the first thing. And, you know, they introduced us to, well, you, you being a helicopter pilot would appreciate that, where we're going up a Highway 1. And when it got to FOB1, they just turned the helicopter on the side that did a right degree turn. And... All of a sudden, you're looking straight down at the highway, you're going, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And Johnny McIntyre, those guys just flipped out. I thought <laughs> something was up because I saw the door going to talk to the pilot, smirking. But that's our introduction. We get off the helicopter. Here's the part that yeah, yeah. I get off. Spike Team Idaho gets on. Glenn Lane's the one zero. Robert Owen is the one one with four or five in ditch or maybe six. I forget what the in ditch count was. They're in a target. Next day, they're missing in action. They're still missing in action today. Those two Green Berets are part of the 50-plus Green Berets from Laos alone that are still missing in action from the secret war in Laos. Just for context there, as you describe this, you, you literally get off of the transport aircraft. Yep. This other team gets on, never to be seen again. Never. right? And, yeah. and you kind of describe this this morose that kind of falls over the FOB the next couple of days because everyone knows the team's out and is not in comms and nobody knows where they are. Yeah. And, you know, and this is May, 1968. So that happens 
And at the same time, this is May when we had um, the, um, the Cam Duck, which was the original uh, first MACV SOG training base, which was an I Corps close to the border. And, but it was in the valley and had a lot of bad weather issues. Camp Duck got overrun. There's a brilliant book called Bait, B-A-I-T, about that, that battle, the site, what went on there. Incredible story. That A camp got overrun. There have been three other A camps in the Ashaw Valley that were overrun in 66, 65 and 66. So we, we had heard about this. Not only that, we had ST Alaska. The entire team was wiped out in May. The one zero E and E for three days, John Allen. They, someone, a helicopter pilot saw him near the border, picked him up and brought him back. You know, John was never to see him again. Uh, we had another helicopter that was shot down on a target. John Robertson went down. Another team got wiped out. And this is just up at FOB one, running targets into Laos, not meshing anywhere else. And then during that time, the table talk at the clubhouse was still like about all the other teams that had either been wiped out, disappeared, or one or two people survived and came back to talk about it. Jeez. Oh, and I forgot the most terrifying part about our briefing in Da Nang. We learned that, that uh, Paul Villarosa, our trainer, who helped us become Green Berets, was there, he ran with some of the first missions out of FOB4. He got wiped out, his team. And they, they, it was just a horrible death for him. So all this is hitting us within three days. And you get to FOB1, well, there is RT, I mean, Spike Team ASP, Spike Team, uh, I forget the other one. But back to back, two teams just wiped out. Johnny Calhoun, his team. And so the team got out. Johnny Calhoun was on the ground helping all the indig get out. And he gets killed. If you can, for the people who haven't seen your interview with Jocko or read the book yet, you mentioned Spike Team, and then in the book it's referenced as ST, and then a state name off in Idaho, Alaska. Um, what did that typically consist of? And if you can describe the one zero reference yeah, we, for people from our in '68, the recon teams were called Spike Teams because everything had a code name. No, you wouldn't come out and say this is a recon team. <laughs> oh no, we're top secret. We have Spike Teams. <laughs> yeah of course by that time the nva knew what we were um so spike team we had and so the spike team would be two or three americans with anywhere from six to nine maybe ten indigenous troops you would train together as a team on the missions the team leader whose code name would be a one zero so the one zero is the team leader one one is assistant team leader one two would be the radio operator and in my case, even when I became the one zero, I still carried the radio because we did our own airstrikes. This is before close air support doctrine of the Air Force today, where you have the JSOCs or what's the official title for the uh, Air Force guys that are assigned to teams? JTACs. Yeah. JTACs, thank you. Yep. And uh, so that would be the recon team. We had hatchet forces that would have two or three companies and they would pull operations anywhere from a uh, platoon to a company, sometimes maybe two companies in rare cases. Contoum had a very successful hatchet force program. And of course the most successful was Operation Tailwind, but we could talk more about that later. So then from there, it would, uh, uh, it, by the end of the year, they evolved, we just called them recon teams. Hatchet force stayed the same. And each FOB had different names. We like in the uh, FOB one, FOB two, we all had state names. So hence my team was ST Idaho. Never been to Idaho. And for years thereafter, I had never been. I finally went to Idaho a few years ago and I was working for a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> all the, all those years it came full circle. Indeed. So um, if we could just talk about the mission briefly, and then we'll get into some of the, the experience, but the well, reason you, know, you are I, where you are, what is that mission set? Well, here's the other thing too, um, Ryan. Yeah. You, in answer to your first question, we wandered a little bit, but I get into camp in May. We did in-country ambushes, but th that was, we didn't do anything like that for three or four weeks. So we were doing training. We had to bring together a new team. You know, fortunately, Spider Parks became our one zero. 
Spider had been on the team. He'd been promoted to his own team. But when Idaho got wiped out, he came back 1-0. Don Wolcombe became the 1-1. And I knew Spider from Fort Bragg. We had gone through training group together. And I was his catcher on the uh, team softball, softball team. So we knew him. And we had to hire new and did. We hired three kids that were 15 years old. And there was maybe one or two others that were a little bit older. I forget who they hired, but those three I remember because they were 15. And even then, I mean, I'm an old man at 22 going, I can't believe we're hiring kids 15 years old. But we yeah. trained up. We did in-country ambushes every day. We're out there. The spider had us on the drills, weapons, repelling, helicopters, repelling out of helicopters, ropes, you name it, we did it. You were an E2 at the time, John? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I get there, Spidey goes, you're an E-deuce? He said, we got to get you promoted to PFC. <laughs> so as soon as you get that PFC stripe, roll your sleeves up so people think you're a sergeant. <laughs> love it. I love it. That's great. All right. Um, I, I, I want to talk about the indigenous forces, but just real quick, if you can. Sure. The mission that you guys are there to do. It, your FOB, what was that? Well, our it is multifaceted. First of all, it's go across the fence, and there's a series of missions from there. They could be anything from an area recon, which would be, hey, what's going on? Like the one we had in Cambodia, there's three NBA divisions that are missing. Could you go find them for us? <laughs> or uh, a point recon, like um, they were coming south with fuel lines. By the end of 68, we heard about it. Go in for that. Um, try to get a POW. We had a, a couple of teams in Contum that were very successful. And um, Dick Meadows of legend, of Special Forces legend, he, his team picked up 12 separate POWs over, the, over one year of running recon. And in my case, we, we tried it a few times. We were close a few times, but we never were successful. Um, you, John, can you talk about the incentive structure for capturing a POW? Because <laughs> I, I find this amusing. Yeah, if we got a, if we captured a live POW and brought it back, we got a week's R and R and a hundred dollars bonus, so we could spend it on R and R anywhere in the world. They know how to motivate uh, a soldier. Absolutely, man. Love it. <laughs> okay, sorry. So you got area recon, point recon. Yeah, the, the wiretaps. Um, POWs, try to capture a POW. A few of our teams uh, had heard about a, a, an American POW base that was that the NVA held. We would always try to get to them if we had any intel at all, regardless of what the primary mission was. And uh, we had a team that had a unique experience with that, but we could talk about that a little later. And then, um, you know, there would be uh, the point mission, like to blow up a fuel line. And um, then we had to do bright light. So anytime a team would get in trouble, we would go in. And the bright light was the most dangerous of all missions in that a team was down with casualties or down pilot. And they knew you were coming to get them. So in that case, all you carried was ammo, bullets, hand grenades, uh, extra rounds for the M79, extra bandages and a body bag. And one canteen of water, no food. And that's it. And so that was the bright light. Uh, BDA's bomb damage assessment. You know, the Air Force and all its brilliance. And you're familiar with that a little bit. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They uh, said, you know what? We come over with a B-52 strike. Why don't some of you Green Berets just go out there and okay, stroll through it, take a look at the area, let us know how effective the bombs were. <laughs> They'll all be dead. Rot, not. They were yeah. very active and always pissed off. So when you went in for a bomb damage assessment, it could get pretty ugly pretty quick. God. Those are yeah. the primary missions. Okay, great. So just with, with that in mind, yeah. um, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to transition to your first experience in combat. So where, where you're out of training and you're truly like going across the wire, just over the fence, however you want to describe it, into enemy territory for the first time. Were you in the one one, the one two? Um, who was your your one zero at that time? What were you yeah. feeling like at that moment? Well, here's the thing. I mean, the first three missions we ran, uh, one was an in country training mission, but it was an official mission. We were on the east side of Yashaw with another team, 
Spider was the one zero. We made no contact. And the other, we had another team that ran parallel with us. We were on different sides of a ridge line and we were both moving south for some reason. But anyways, just like I said, it was an in-country mm-hmm. training mission. But that was the first real one. We get inserted, everything's geared up. We have the covey, air assets are there. If we make contact, we can call in support. The other team ambushed a path that Lao ambush. So that was pretty cool, but that was them. But then we ran two missions of, um, so before your contact, we ran two missions inserting Air Force sensors, one in the Ashaw Valley, and we put one up at Quezon off of Highway 9 there by the, by the base. So Spider Parks is going, you've run three missions and you haven't even gotten your CIB yet, WTF. And so I said, well, that's okay with me. I'm happy to yeah. go all year long without it, you know? <laughs> exactly. So that all changed on that Echo 4, October the, um, the 7th, uh, 1968. Whew. I love how you remember that so specifically. And just before we dive into it, when you were on those those first three training missions. Yeah. No, the first three were real missions. Yeah. Yeah. So I shouldn't even say training. Right. Those missions. Were yeah. you as amped up as you thought you'd be? Like, what was that feeling after having seen all the movies, that, the books you've read? Was this like, all right, here I am going in. This is the real deal. Yeah. But, you know, we always heard, even, even back in basic training, AIT, the cadre, no matter where you went, they said, remember, the enemy will fight when they want to fight. And so if they're ready to fight, you better have your shit together because they're coming for you. They want to fight on that day. And so with those missions, it's like, okay, we, we got, it's a good mission. It's done. We, got the, the, we inserted the Air Force sensors. They're happy. We're happy. And uh, I'll, I'll take a mission with yeah. that gunfire. And right. uh, so that was fine. And, um, but we knew that was going to change. And, th- uh, and so the reason why I remember the date so is because Lynn Black had that historic, probably one of the most legendary missions in the eight years of SOG history, where the nine man recon team had an inexperienced team leader. And the team leader took the team in and uh, they should have gotten back on the helicopters and left, but he didn't. He was inexperienced. He walked the team into an ambush. So nine men on a SOG recon team came up eventually against 10,000 NVA. And thanks to the air support and to the recon team, Lynn Black, who was on that mission, talked to the NVA officer 20 years later who ambushed him. Wow. And he told him, that they inflicted 90% casualties on a 10,000 man division on one day. So the very next day, we get inserted into Echo 4. Uh, it was a good insertion, but by two or three o'clock, we had trackers. We tried to lose them. When we set up our RON at night, they were close and uh, they had fired a couple of rounds and they're like within, it felt like within 20, 30 feet. But again, we're in the jungle. So you can't see 20 or 30 feet. Um, at two o'clock in the morning, I was on guard duty. We, we rotated and, I, and Wolken was right next to me. I said, I can hear somebody in front of our Claymore. And so I said, I'm, can I blow it? He said, no, I thought he said, go. So I blow off a Claymore in the middle of the jungle at two o'clock <laughs> in the morning. Nobody on our team was happy about that, but I think we may have gotten one. But anyways, so in the morning we got up, left the first light. By two o'clock, a little before two o'clock, we had come up a side steep hill. We came out of the jungle just to try to get further up this mountain. At one point we looked back, we saw two NVA stand there at Port Arms and they were smiling. So that didn't look good. So I told Don, he took us up to a little knoll and we set up the knoll. He says, make comma. We're going to have, and Sal, our Vietnamese team leader, who was like Buku VC. And so Don told me to try to raise radio traffic and um, we made contact. So we were in contact. Just before you get into the contact there, John, 
um, there are a few things that you just described, and I think it's it's so unique to the mission set you were in, but the insertion, right? Like you describe being shot out of multiple LZs. And I'm not saying that it happened in this case, but when you say insertion here, I'm assuming your insertions are all helo dropping you in. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this like, before they did any of the uh, parachuting in. So you you do a helo in. Yeah, the then, King, the H-34 for the South Vietnamese Air Force, they took us, they dropped us off, two helicopters. They dropped me, Don, and Sal off. Then the second helicopter came in with um, uh, Jim and the two remaining team members. And then how far would you move from that initial insertion point to your bed down site at night? That's a good question. Because when we moved, we moved on our traditional um, MO, which was we moved 10 minutes, and then stop and do nothing for 10 minutes. Just listen, because if the jungle sounded right, then that was really important. And of course, Sal, who, who by 68 had been on the running recon for three years, Hep was our interpreter. He had been running about as long as uh, Sal. And then Fook was our point man, because uh, Sal had trained him up to be the point man. So Wolken was the team leader. I was the one one at that point. And then Jim was the uh, one, two. It, I wanted to ask, because you mentioned this in the book, Fook yeah. in particular, and I think it was on one of your earlier missions where you observe his situational awareness, right? Where he is just so attuned probably to like what you're describing, the, the, the movements, the sounds, everything. And, and you're kind of in awe of it. And I've certainly been in that space with a more experienced pilot where yeah. they are like five minutes ahead of me in the fight. They just can see what's going to happen and how to position things. And I, I was just hoping you could explain a little bit about that, like how long they'd been in and what that situational awareness was like, and then how long it took for you to feel like you were at a comparable level. Oh, let's, let me be honest about that. I never got to a comparable <laughs> level. And I'm alive today thanks to the level of intensity and their intuitive instincts that they have when they're on the ground. Um, Sal particularly, and uh, Sal had trained up Fook. Fook was really sharp. Uh, Fook and a few other members on our team, their families had all left North Vietnam in 1954 after the North Vietnamese defeated the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in May of 54. And there was 18 months where families could go south or north. Well, nobody went north to communism but thousands and thousands of families came south. And um, Fook was one of them. And um, anyway, he was just a fearless fighter. And you know, time and time again, I mean, on that mission there, we were running point, we came across two pit vipers. Had I been running point, I would have been dead. Fook saw him. Another time he pointed out, he heard something. Uh, you know, again, I'm like cappy cheers. I don't hear anything. Yeah. But he put he gave us on full alert. And so the team and then Sal, he and Sal made some kind of sign language. And then Sal told us spread out. And then all of a sudden we could hear things happening in the jungle. Well, Fook heard that. And so we figured, oh man, they, they heard us. So we're online. The pins are pulled from the hand grenades. The car 15 is on full automatic. The M79 is off of safety. And here it comes. It was a, what do you call it? A flock, a herd of monkeys. We got <laughs> overrun by monkeys. Oh, God. But that's one of those inst yeah. one of those times where, like, that was my first really serious mission. And Fook heard it. God damn. All right. Well, yeah, yeah please go, go ahead to that first contact at Echo 4 and that experience. Yeah, so we're on top of this little hill. And um, Sal... Wolken and Hep and maybe even Jim were all facing one way. I was on the far right and I forget where Fook was and when the first contact came, but we had set up. Wolken told me to get on the radio, call a prairie fire emergency, which I got on, but nobody answered. So that, that in and of itself is like, help, help, can anybody help? And there's like, <laughs> you know what that's like? The, 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 uh, the yeah. silence is deafening. Yeah. So I'm bored. Nobody's answering my radio. Everybody's hyper. They're all set up. 
I'm opening my can of peaches and then Sal and Hep open up and the NVA come up that knoll in the jungle. And in the first hour of firefight, we never saw one person. We were that close. They would come out and open fire. We blown back into the jungle, back into the jungle. And then at one point, I'm firing into the jungle. The, the AK fire is coming at us. And you could feel them coming out of the jungle, getting ready to emerge. And then Fook opened fire over my shoulder. And oh my, he just shattered my, my hearing, you know. And I'm sitting there going, gosh, darn it. So anyways, we get back to camp. Let me just jump back to camp. We have our, our we're in the, in the team room. I'm talking, I said, I said to our interpreter, Hep, I said, ask Fook why he was behind me shooting over my shoulder. I assume I'm shooting this way and Fook was shooting that way. And uh, <laughs> Hep goes, no. What you didn't see was coming up the hill were three or four NVA and Fook killed all of them. And they were just about to kill you. He wasn't shooting over your shoulder. So you have that, that narrow field of vision, you know, you're locked in. Yeah. And so anyway, I, I thanked him. I said, if I have a hearing loss, that's fine. I'm allowed to talk about it. God. So what, what was the enemy size force that you think you were fighting at that time? We, we never knew. Yeah. I mean, they kept coming at us. And like I said, we didn't see anything until maybe after a couple of hours of this firefight. And we finally made contact. Spider came up. I think it had to be close to a couple of hours. Then God. we ran A1E Sky Raiders. Oh. And then the reason why we knew we killed a lot, Wolken came over to me and said, you won't believe this, look there. And he's, and we could see like a little hill. Well, they're all dead bodies. And the NVA were coming back and stacking up the dead bodies because they wanted to get on top of the dead to shoot down better at us. And it was like, what? And at first I couldn't see it, you know, but then we focused on it. And then they kept coming, round after round. Of course, you know, they could hear the A1 Sky Raiders coming. We had gunships. Um, Scarface came that day. We had the muskets. The judge and the executioner came in. And we went through a series of fast movers. So the, as the first time where, you know, you being a pilot, you, you've heard the training where they tell you when you use a jet, a fast mover, the rounds will get there before you hear it. It's one thing to talk about that, but it's another yeah. thing when the Air Force guy tells you, put your head down, and then all that comes slamming into the jungle. You don't even hear the jet until he comes by with the afterburners. Amazing. And of course, my favorite line from the A1 Sky Raider pilot is crispy critter time. Y'all put your head down now. <laughs> and we did. And no, even there, don't forget the NBA tactics. They knew. By 68, they knew what a Sky Raider was. And they also got, quote, close to the belt, our belt. So when they were here to Sky Raider coming, they would rush us to be close to us to avoid getting napalm, gun runs. And we dropped bombs, napalm, you name it. CBUs, the cluster bomb units. Yeah. We hammered them. And, and the Sky Raiders were, for us, uh, you know, they were on station law and had a vast amount of ordnance. And I know you mentioned later on, as you progress in your tour, you still want to hold the radio basically for calling in those strikes. Were you calling strikes in for that first oh, yeah. engagement? Yeah, that was my job. <laughs> how close, how do you remember, like, were you, what kind of distance were you putting in for the, those first rounds coming down? Well, the, the first couple of rounds we had was the, um, I remember more than anything, the napalm, because it was close enough that you could feel it suck away your air. Wow. And that was the first time we smelled burnt human flesh because they had, they obviously hurt the, burn up some of the enemy soldiers. And then the, uh, the 250, 500 pound bombs, you know, you tell the team, put your head down and you just get, getting that shaken on the ground with your heads in the dirt. And just getting bounced around. So I, I don't know. I can't tell you how close. Yeah. They were. But they were close enough that we that we were able to levitate a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> if if you recall, like I remember the first time I had to pull the trigger on a Hellfire missile and how yeah. nervous I was. 
How nervous were you calling in a fast mover for the first time in combat? Oh, get here as quick as you can. I didn't think about that. It was kind of like, you know, we're, we're, we're going through a lot of bulls here and we could use any support we can get. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I think the fast mover was the first one on scene, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. And I know yeah. we had the A ones and they kept coming back. Damn. Yeah. And then, All we, right. you know, then the first gunships were judging the executioner from the uh, 176th. They came in, they went back and refueled, and Scarface came in with the helicopter gunships. And then we finally uh, had the King Vita came out, and, you know, and the, uh, the muskets made a couple of close runs. And that was the first time that the uh, shell cases, they were so close to us on the gun runs that I had the first time where the shell cases went in my back and burnt my neck. Yeah. So the first thing is, oh, shit. You know, I was like, but on the other hand, thank you. <laughs> yeah. But that because they were firing above you, John? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. All right. The they, they gun run came in so close. They could, the, the King Bee was there on a hover. And I had been at the back part with the other guys, could Don threw the first couple on. Then I got up, we helped, we threw the last guys, and I threw Don in the helicopter. And uh, at some point during that, I remember that's my first neck burn from uh, shell casings. <laughs> And in that, in that engagement, basically, did you break contact and fall back to a pickup point? No. Or how did what that happen? End? Was we were in contact. What Spider was able to pick out a spot that was about maybe 10 or 12 yards that we couldn't see from our knoll. But there was a space about 10 yards, maybe. Uh, but it was elephant grass. Elephant grass is thick gr- elephant grass. It's not bamboo, but it's 12 to 14 feet tall, maybe. And this was really tall. And when you had to go through it, it was just hard getting through it. The, the King Bee, the Captain Tin, hovered there for 10 minutes before we got to it, at least 10 minutes. And he just stayed there waiting for us, which in and of itself is a, is a whole story of him yeah. sitting there. Anyway, we get to a couple of times like we began falling down on the stuff and uh, I fell down. Don ran over my back. Don fell down. I ran over his back. We finally get to the spot where he's, he's hovering. And then uh, we start throwing the little people on first. Then I threw Don on, threw Jim on. And then uh, I was down to my last magazine, the last hand grenade when I moved left. Um. When you guys, when you guys exfilled in that case, were you under contact, like in contact as you were exfilling? Severe. I mean, it was almost dark. So if you could imagine this, you could appreciate this. Um, as we're just lifting off, I put down my last hand grenade, last Willie Pete, and the last magazine. And uh, then at my last minute, I, I threw out my last uh, M79 round. And it's almost dark. And you have this dark emerald jungle with, I want to say thousands now, but hundreds of little, pretty little lights. And you had these green tracers coming up, arcing up to our king bee. It was beautiful, except it was pretty deadly. (laughs) (laughs) So we took off and yeah, so we left under severe enemy fire. Wow. And then as we're, he, uh, Captain Tin just flew straight south for a couple of minutes and then when that happened, it was the most beautiful sunset we'd ever seen. So we went from that extreme, you know, I called it the apocalyptic death roar of that yeah. mortal combat. And then they're shooting as they were leaving. And then all of a sudden, we're above the ground and uh, that beautiful sunset. We went back, they had a floor show. Nobody was there to greet us. They were in the floor show. Jeez. Hey, you're back. Good to see you. <laughs> Have a good to get a beer. It, and when you came back from that, John, like what, I, I don't know, you just survived death. It sounds, did you guys take any casualties in that? No. Amazing. So you come back, no casualties, but you've just been through a, a serious gunfight. Oh, like yeah. what, what was going through your head in terms of, all right, I've been here less than a month. I've got 11 more of these to go. Well, remember that was October. So by that time, uh, we, I'd been at Fubai, um, five months. Okay. 
But, but, but I mean, you still got a long time to go. I mean, what? Oh yeah. What was that feeling like coming back from that mission? Well, the first thing is you wonder if you're going to see Christmas or not. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's October. And um, it was, you know, we had heard about the, the firefights and we had all the stories about saving as much ammo as you can. But um, just getting through that, it's like we're back at base. It's like, whoa, I'm just glad to be alive. So we went down, got food for the team, brought the food and the soda back. And then went down to the floor show. And then, you know, my uh, my fellow recon man, a good friend, John Walton, he he and I would always talk after he did a mission, I talked to him. So I finally had a mission to talk about. So John's talking to me. At one point he goes, Hey, did you uh, did you kill anybody today? It's like, didn't think about that, because you're just trained to get through it, you know? And uh, so I thought about it and then Later, we had been in contact. Spider had been on scene, and then Pat Watkins came out. They took turns rotating as a covey. And uh, I was on the radio, and again, I was, I was looking down the hill where Fook had, had cleared out the NVA before. And I saw something moving. And what it was was, I think it was the NVA's ass. He was coming up the hill, crawling up. But we had fire lanes. Fook had developed a couple of fire lanes down there. So I'm on the radio and he, this guy poked his head up, one round, just popped, exploded it. And uh, so I knew my first real That was your first. Day. Yeah. Jeez. And it was like, oh my God. And then, you know, we talked about it and Spider and I later talked and he said, did you kill anybody? I said, yeah. He said, well, remember, it's you, you were them. And so just be count your, count your lucky stars. If you don't mind just spending a second on that, John, no, no, um, no. I interviewed Tom Shea, who's a retired Navy SEAL who led a team in Helmand province, sure. 2009, brutal fighting. Um, and he, he, he described as some of his guys on a SEAL team, in fact, were having some of their first KIA going around and, and talking to them to like maintain this human connection so they don't lose sight of it as they're starting to kill people. Was it hard for you to pull the trigger? It, it sounds like you talked to Spider about it. You have these discussions with John. Like, was that some, was that a bit of an outlet for you? No, it was more like um, just talking about a day on the job. Whew. But by that point, we had trained so much. You know, all the muscle, <clears throat> excuse me, all the muscle tra training from going through training on the range day after day, it all paid off. And you don't think about it. You just think about there's the enemy. You got to kill him, get the airstrikes in. Is everybody okay? And then get the team on the helicopter. Yeah. You mentioned, you've mentioned Covey a couple of times. Could you just share the context for that and the role it plays in, in these missions? Yeah. And again, it's um, unique to SOG the way we did it. Um, Covey was a code name for the fact, forward air controller. He's basically the liaison between the troops on the ground and TAC air. In our case, there would be an Air Force pilot. <clears throat> In the early days, it would be an O2, push pool Cessna. And then there would be a Green Beret, Covey rider. And that rider would talk to the team. Then the rider would just lean over and tell the pilot, and they would coordinate the air assets from there. So it was, it was a wonderful situation because more than once, I mean, anybody that ran who um, was on the ground in contact, we appreciated having experienced a team leader as a cubby rider because they knew what you're up against. They could make suggestions. And in some cases we had uh, cubby riders that were dealing with a green one zero or a green team leader. And they would calm them down, say, settle down or you're going to die. <clears throat> and they, they were able to get them to, to, to operate. In my case, I was just lucky. You know, we had Spider. We had gone through the training. And when it was time, we knew what the, uh, what the rules of engagement were, how to make the gun runs and everything else. So we just went ahead and did it. You know, you describe, I, I believe it's after ST Idaho is taken out early on as you arrive 
you describe your decision to carry a grenade, like this is what I'm going to carry with me. I'm not going to be taken prisoner. Um, sounds like it's discussed within the teams to some degree. Um, oh yeah. Right you, here we had the last hand grenade. I guess I, I have talked to a few folks where the, it's almost like they come to a point in a deployment where they're like, all right, I might not make it out. <clears throat> I, I come to terms with it mentally. Family's going to be okay. And I'm not going to get taken prisoner here. Like what was going through your mind that, how did you come to that decision? Well, very early on, um, Johnny Mack and I had talked about it. And of course the other guys, you know, like the young guys are in camp. We all agreed that we weren't going to be POWs because by that time we knew what the official POWs were going through in North Vietnam, the way the communists treated any captured prisoner. Um, <clears throat> and we, by that time we'd had at least one port of one of our guys who had been um, decapitated. He had been disemboweled and then they put his head into the, uh, into the part of the body where the bowels were and uh, other places, other things like that. And then with, with, um, with uh, Paul, when he was killed, the first KIA out of the FOB4, um, they, they, they charred him with a, with a flamethrower. And they knew that the other team members were saw it. And uh, they were trying to make it, you know, they did PSYOPs, so. <clears throat> Yeah, so in, in our mind, we made a determination that if we're down, that last hand grenade, we're just going to hold it and we go, we're going to take as many scumbags with us as possible. God. Wow. And I forgot. And here's a footnote on the King Bee that pulled us out that night. Yeah. 48 bullet holes are different <laughs> from different ordnance, including one that was the size of a baseball that went through the, um, the top rotor. It's so interesting the way you describe it in the book, because the um, kind of the heroics, the courage of the, those crews to oh. like Captain Tin to hover, it probably sounds pretty easy, but like you're hovering there and, and your focus is just like, get these guys on board and, and you're taking fire the whole time. And you really pay a tribute, in my opinion, obviously coming from another pilot, but to that type of courage that was needed in those moments. Oh. Incredible. I mean, you know, at first, you know, we get in country, get that first ride in King Bee. It's kind of like these are old helicopters and they're flown by our allies. Just how good are the allies? You know, it's yeah. that first question. I mean, it's just a natural question. Well, I'm alive. Just thanks to King Bee Pilot. And I can't, I can't say it was like one mission, Echo 4. There were so many missions that I've lost count. I wish I had kept a diary now of each one. Man. What, um, what was your op tempo like? So you described coming out of Echo 4. Like, are yeah. you back in the next day? Do you get a week? Like, what, what does that look like? Well, um, in that case, no, we didn't go right back in. Um, well, there's two reasons. Um, we, we still had other teams in camp that were inserted. And because they knew of the severity of the mission we'd been through, and then Don Wolken was the one zero. So... Within 24 or 48 hours, we went through a team change. He landed a job as a Covey rider. And then it came down to me either being a one zero or getting in a new, another one zero. And I talked it over with the team and Spider, and they all just said, hey, let's go for it. And so I became the team one zero. And then Jim, who had been on, he ran one mission with us. He came up from the 173rd. And uh, he told me, brother, I can't do this. I've, you know, I had a tour of duty with the herd, but I've never seen anything like this because he was with Hep and Sal in those early initial rushes where they just kept blowing them back time after time. And Jim just held his ground, just a stud of a soldier. But he just said, I can't do this. I said, well, thanks for telling me. I'd rather have you be honest now yeah. in the fold in the field. So I talked to the Sergeant Major, we got him a new assignment. And uh, like in the, in the book, at the end of the chapter, I talked to him like 30 years later and Jim said, I've never been the same. Never been the same because of the combat or from having left the unit? 
Oh no, no, the combat. The combat. Yeah, I imagine. I mean, Can't be. They they had the they were right at the that point, the worst point in the beginning. And uh, they were just over and over. I mean, how many times could <laughs> And yeah. these guys kept coming. That's the, the dedication of the enemy soldiers were incredible. Wow. Yeah. So and, and so to the op tempo, like how how often were you going back into the field uh, well, on these? It varied. On these missions? Like, sometimes it varied on other teams and availability. Weather always weather every day. Yeah. The whiskey X ray factor, you know. Um. So uh, we got, um, I got a new team member. We trained him up, John Bubba, sure. He trained up pretty quick. And we ran a couple of, sh of brief missions that we got, we were on the ground, surely got shot out. And then we came to November. And again, we had um, um, a mission, mission where we tried the, um, to try to find an LZ. Cause we had two or three days where in the morning we went in you get shot out of the primary, the, the alternate, and then the secondary LZs. You get shot out. You're out of gas. You fly back, eat lunch. Here's your new target. That's it. Covey will find an LZ. Go out, get shot out. Now, that can wear you out. And we did that two or three days in a row. And then, um, so finally, somebody came up with the idea. Let's try something new. Let's get a uh, daisy cutter. We'll find a patch of jungle where there's no trails, drop the daisy cutter, the team can repel in, you get on the ground, and you can go run a mission and find out what's going on. Great idea. So the first day, you know, they dropped a 2,000 pounder, the king bee's coming in, I'm standing on, on the uh, step, got the rope ready to repel, and then all of a sudden, ba -ba boom, ba -ba -ba boom, there's secondary explosions. And they had over I forget over three or four dozen secondary explosions that day. We had hit a cache, an enemy cache. <laughs> you can't win. You can't I win. <laughs> I so, you know, somewhere to this day, Ho Chi Minh's going, how did those guys figure out where that cache was up there in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, you know? But <laughs> um, so we came back and did it a day later, did the same thing. And this time when I was repelling down, we had enemy that was around us so we were compromised and that's the one where i got pulled out and got turned upside down i was kind of embarrassed and went back and did it again the next day we went out again got shot out three more times john look could you just i mean you can't just gloss over this turned upside down hooked in i mean could you just I, just a couple minutes i know it's just, you probably told it many times before but jesus well only for, only for you ryan it's for frightening you, all ryan, right thanks for your Appreciate audience it. okay man Thanks. <laughs> well, what had happened, I repelled into the ground, I'm down the ground, and there were a couple of people talking at first. And so we're, I gave them the sign, and I got on the radio, said, abort, we're compromised, there's people here. Because, you know, the idea is you get inserted without being compromised to run a mission. So finally, there's a couple, one or two NVA did show up, had a brief contact with them. Um the helicopter pilot had taken off, but they came back to pick me up. And so I hooked in. At that time, we had a Swiss seat. It's a rope seat with a D-ring. And they throw down a 150-foot rope with a D-ring and a sandbag on it. So we would hook into that. And then we had a D-ring on our harness that you're supposed to hook into. So if you get shot, or something happens, you're stabilized and you won't fall out of, out of your rig. So I hooked up and the helicopter pilot heard the gunfire from the NVA. So he lifted off right away. So as he's lifting off, all of a sudden, I'm holding on to the rope and then shooting at the NVA. And then as we came up, instead of going all the way up 150 feet, I forget where we were going, rising, but I turned into a human pinball, ricocheted off these trees, and like trying to fight these. <laughs> and so my arms got bloodied up at the armpit. I mean, the uh, and the, where the arm, elbow comes together. Yeah. They're both bloody from getting battered, getting out of the trees. So we break out, and I'm holding on. I look down, I hadn't hooked <laughs> up the D ring. So I'm trying to hook the D ring. Oh my God. 
So by now, whatever 80, 90 knots or 100 miles an hour, whatever a king bee flies at, it's cold and my arms are sore. So I rotated and went to rotate again, hit an air pocket and it just flipped me upside down. It's like, oh, and my Swiss seat went right down to my knees. So I spread my legs and I, I'm upside down and all my gear came down on my neck. And I'm reaching around, signaling to Henry King that he was my, he was on a team. Get this damn thing down. Anyways, um, so then the rope slid down to my feet and I just had my feet spread wide open. And then I'm starting to pass out. And I finally passed out. Right before I passed out, I, uh, I had the, my life fast before my eyes. I saw the headline in the newspaper. I was really pissed off because my death was reported in South Vietnam. That's a lie. I'm in Laos. <laughs> and my death was below the fold. It was like, you know, back in the early days of the war, every local guy killed would be a story on the front page above the fold. So I was pissed about that. And then I passed out. Did you pass out because of the equipment on your neck cutting yeah, off? I, just, I couldn't off? breathe. Wow. Because my, uh, my harness came down and then um, so all the web gear came back on my neck. And then also because of my backpack, it was entangled somehow so that the weight of my backpack with the radio and everything and all my web gear, the web belt just came up and choked me. I couldn't pull it or break it loose. Oh, so we're upside down and I was worried about my feet, you know I mean? Trying to keep spread enough. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Where, uh, when you woke up, like, where were you? Uh, when I passed out, I thought I felt elephant grass and uh, Captain Tuong had descended. I didn't realize it because I'm, you know, I was yeah, of course. Busy anything. So I passed out, hit the elephant grass. I fell maybe 10 or 12 feet. Jeez. And then King came out, untied all my web gear, <laughs> left it right there. So my car 15, my SOG knife, it's all lying right there in Laos to this day. Jesus. But the happy thing was when my head bounced off that metal floor, I felt it. I go, oh, <laughs> that pain feels so good. <laughs> I'm still alive. It's the ground. Yeah. All right. No, um, it, was the, it was the metal of the helicopter, the king. <laughs> I got you. I got yeah, you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about when, when you were anointed, named, or placed as the one zero. Yeah. How long had you been in country at the time when, when you were put in that leadership role? It was right around October 10th, 12th, right around there. So I'd been in country May, June, five months. And by that time, Spider had trained the team up really well. Don Wolkman followed his footsteps. We continued with the in-country training. We ran those missions. And uh, so I felt fairly confident. Yeah. And, um, you know, I would have preferred to have another one zero. Life's a lot easier as a one one. <laughs> yeah, I you hear know, you. If anything goes wrong, the one zero gets blamed and gets chewed out for it. <laughs> but That's we right. talked over our little team. And we'd had that bad experience with Alabama. Because October 5th, um, the team leader had walked the team into an ambush on a trail. Just violated every rule of recon, SOG recon. Never walked down a trail. When there's, a, when there's an enemy flag flying, you're in that battalion area. At least, you know, you should leave. It's time to go home. Particularly if they're shooting at you. But he, he was too stubborn. And he paid the price. He died within a short while afterwards. And he as you assume the one zero role, you could take this however you'd like, but what was the relationship like with the, as you described the indigenous forces? Um, were you always paired up with the same folks? You described like a couple 15 year olds. Um, well, we, okay. Our team, we had um, at that point it was myself. Wolken became the cubby rider. And then we got a new American, John Bubba Shore. So that required, you know, breaking Bubba in. And we had a record team. So we had a consistent number of men. You know, Sal was the senior member, the Vietnamese team leader. Hep was our interpreter. And then we had um, Tuan that was a grenadier. And those are the most experienced people. And then Fook, who was just a, a great point man. So th that was the hardcore. Of the three 15-year-olds, son, S-O-N, was... Um, trained up to be a point man. And by the end, of, by the middle of November, 
um, we had Sun running point for us on one of our targets. Wow. And then we had the other guys. And like I said, um, we, we had that period of time <clears throat> where we tried that daisy cutter. There have been a couple of days before we'd gone in and gotten shot out, in and shot out. We tried the daisy cutter. I'm embarrassed. We come back. But the guys are tired because, you know, you know what it's like. If you go in and get under enemy fire three times and you live to talk about it one day, you do it twice. Uh, and that, plus all that flying back and forth, just waiting and, and yeah. getting shot out. And one of those times when we were descending, Sal saw a wire across the LZ. How does Sal see that? I don't know. But he was able to tell the uh, door gunner because we're in a King Bee. And he was able to, to, to avert and miss that wire. When they came back, they hit it, and it had a 500-pound bomb attached to it. Had we hit the wire, they, we would have just been obliterated, just blown out of air, literally. So that was part of that drama. So we had the upside-down thing. The next day or the day after, we did it again, getting shot out. I rotated some of the team members, and then – we got shot out in the morning. The afternoon, they gave us another target. This time, we get in. And I went in with eight men. And uh, we got on the ground. And it was a, it was an old area. The, the farmers used to do what they call slash and burn. And so the area we were in was an old slash and burn area. And I got the team. And we got online. And it's when we marched for an hour up that mountain, only pausing like, momentarily because normally we do 10 and 10 yeah for this day i wanted something really different i wanted to get away from the lz we were uncertain about the weather and so we finally came up to this trail a huge trail they could drive tanks down it you wouldn't see it from the sky though so we came to the trail we crossed it set up the ambush and the ambush was designed with claymores with c4 in the middle so that when people walk through it one person would live Everybody else would be killed. And then one person in the middle would be knocked out with C4. That person would be our POW. So we had the POW set up, had the claymores for security, claymores in the back. Sal ran up the wiretap, had a great wiretap running. Spider came back for a combo check. I forget how long we've been on the ground, two or three hours now. And it was perfect. We got across that trail, it was just everything's just gone so good. So the ambush is set up. I gave Spider the code for POW. I said, we'll see you back at the LZ. And Spider goes, I'm at 10,000 feet. And I can't see the mountain you're on, let alone wow. see you. And the weather socked us in. So we had to break. So a few minutes later, we could hear tanks above us. And then where people on the trail had been diddy bopping, they're out down there with the AK-47s on the shoulder. We saw a couple officers. Ah. Uh, and they just had their holsters. They, they, we were in some kind of an area that they had a base camp not too far away. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. They're all like scurrying up and down the trail. The t we hear tanks. And so then we finally go, okay, now we got to get out of here. So we pulled down the wiretap, pulled in the ambush and the security claim wars, moved, went back across the trail I forget what direction we, we looked at the trail. We went to the left, moved on tonight. We came to a stream, a small stream. By now we can hear dogs, a lot of dogs. We get into the stream. We go up the stream. And at some point we took a break and the stream was like, had high walls on the side, maybe 10, 15 feet on each side. So as, as we go out of the stream, a little, not really a stream, like a big brook or something, our, I set the team out and come back, out and come back to give false trails for the dogs. Then we put down uh, patterned mace and black pepper, a lot of it. So if the <laughs> dogs hit it would just screw up their noses, you know. And at one point in the break, Sal climbed a tree. He came back and his eyes were like this. And his eyes are like this, man. That's like, we're in trouble. He said, there's hundreds of NVA coming up the hill, 
with the dogs and their lanterns. So we stayed in that brook, even though it was dark, we, we never moved at night, but we kept going. And then finally, after a couple hours of moving in the dark, um, Sal took us up the hill, set up an RON or perimeter, and I was facing that brook. And that's the night when this NVA came up and touched my boot. But it wasn't like quick. Oh, when he walked past, there was two guys that walked past us in the brook. They had their lantern. They went up, they ran out of fuel as a lot of the others now. So this is two, three o'clock in the morning. They kept coming for us. And even these guys were coming back down the trail, Hep coughed. And it's like, oh, Chihuahua. So I'm sitting there my feet spread, I have my car 15 pointed. And whenever the wind blew, that NVA would crawl up the hill and finally he touched my boot. And he hey, just- Yeah, what'd he do? I just heard, he went, I could hear him catch his breath and he was close, but he didn't do anything for him. If there had been any other sound other than him going backwards, I would have opened fire, single shot. And, but he backed down, but he moved only when the wind blew. Again, retreating down that bank, he gets into the brook and then takes off with his guys, his other buddy there. So before first light, we were out of there. Cheating death again. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. We moved all day, you know, up that mountain. And then, because they, the weather wasn't breaking. So we get up to the top of the mountain about two or three o'clock in the morning. Russians came in with a resupply. They did an aerial resupply and the whole side of the mountain, two mountains away, just lit up like Broadway. Hey, we're trying to get tack air on the calling of these Russians, right? At least shoot down a supply ship. Exactly. God. And then I, I'm curious, you, you describe, I think it's Captain Tan after you come back from a mission, he goes and he, you, you invite him to come have a drink. And he's like, you know what, I got to go back with my family. Oh yeah. What, um, what was the dynamic like with the indigenous forces for you guys day well, to day? Um, in our case, we we're just blessed with the South Vietnamese pilots because they were the majority of them, like any unit, there's a dud or two. And you, you'll hear some other stories that are negative. But in my case, you know, the recon guys just smiled on me. Got a Captain Tin, Captain Tuong, there's Lieutenant Trung. Each of these men put their life on the line for our recon team so many times. And so there was a period of time when they would be able to come into our clubhouse. They would come up in the morning, get the briefing. And then sometimes the, after asserting a team, they would come back. And we always buy them drinks. We told them, you, you just cannot, you cannot buy drinks here. And <laughs> uh, that night, yeah, that's why it, Tin, another time with Captain Tuong, was like, after saving our ass, come on, come on to the club, we'll buy you a drink. There's a floor show. Well, he's, he goes, I'm sorry, my, my wife and family are waiting. And that's the same pilot that saved John Walton's life on August the 3rd, Captain Tin. Man. Um, all right. I'd, I'd like to ask just one more story, if I can, John, if yeah. what comes to mind is one of the more difficult ones that you found yourself in, whether it's from a leadership perspective, or just dangerous in, in your mind, but as you're a little deeper into your deployment, what, um, what comes to mind for one of those <clears throat> other operations? Well, I mean, Thanksgiving day, 1968, <laughs> Christmas day, 1968. I mean, you know, um, on Thanksgiving, our mission was to find three NVA divisions. That's 10,000 men each. The first, the third, and the seventh NVA divisions were, quote, missing in action. The CIA, the DIA, and whoever the hell else was out there had lost contact with three NVA divisions. And that night, I uh, worked with the S3. The CO was there with us. And we went over the latest intel reports picked an area for the LZ and um, we went in the next day. It was Thanksgiving day. And the CEO goes, look, this is a dangerous target. He says, and we were TDY now. We were down in uh, FOB six, which was Honok Tau. And we were um, Northwest of Saigon. And uh, he goes, this is a bad target. He says, because it's a bad target um, and it's Thanksgiving, before you guys go in, we'll give you Thanksgiving dinner. Well, cool. 
Great. Never had that before. So yeah, <laughs> we go up to the LZ, we get up to the launch site early at boot up. Helicopters come in, we had a full Thanksgiving dinner. We get on the helicopters and launch, get inserted. I forget how long we were on the ground, maybe an hour, hour and a half. I just forget the exact time. And we came to a campsite. Campfires were still burning. And we could st- and the, the thing that drew us to it was we just saw smoke. This is Cambodia. After being in Laos where you, know, you couldn't see people more than two feet away or three feet away is so thick with the vegetation. Here you could see for several hundred yards. It was more like a US forest and not even heavily forested at that. And so we're going into the camp, take a few pictures. Sal's eyes are like, man, they're like plates now. And he's really like, there's Buku NVA, Buku VC. I'm going like, oh, one zero. I don't see any commies here. <laughs> well, after I had that stupid thought, I never articulated it. We could see the NVA. I forget which one came first, but the point element, we later figured out that point element from the one division was coming into that base camp. And the rear security from another division came back to the base camp. And they were running at port arms. So that's the image I'll take to my grave with me, watching these guys come back. And they and they came into the camp. Um, they determined where we were and we opened fire. And that's where we were using. I called in the gunships, called for emergency exfil. We had a prairie fire emergency. And um, we went back to the primary LZ. And uh, the gun runs kept them off of us. And then we also did a, um, we used a five second fuse is what our claim was. We would put them down, put one in front of a tree, pull that thing and run. You could feel the blast in your back, but that slowed them down enough. Between that, the regular claim wars or M79 rounds, we're doing that fallback thing, you know, going back and we finally get to the LZ. They came right in, the Green Hornets from the uh, Air Force. The uh, 20th Special Operations Squadron is still operational today. Them lads came in. If they hadn't come in, man, I don't want to think about it. And Gosh. as we're lifting off, it was that LC was muddy. And so there was a, a little bit of jungle there, but only like one level of jungle. And so they're running at Port Arms. They're coming out into the open and they're trying to stop and, and they're digging their heels and they're trying to bring their guns down to port arms from port arms to shoot. Right. And the mud clumps from their feet are going up into the props. And then me and the door gunner, we opened up and just like one of those, remember those, those cartoons on the TV where you see a guy running and this like boom, goes way back. Suddenly yep. this is real life. Those NVA came out. They're trying to come down. We hit them so hard. And we're right on the same level and just literally blew them back into the jungle as we're lifting off. God. Oh, it was just like, oh, yeah. So that, in answer to your question, Thanksgiving Day, you know, you know, Christmas Day, we're on top of that knoll, but the combat wasn't that intense. But we're the whole hill was a fire. <laughs> and Captain Tuong came in at the last second. The prop wars held back the fire long enough so we could get on the King Bee. As we left, the whole hill was just covered in fire. God, it's funny. My, I think I had told you, John, my old man was a Huey pilot in Vietnam, right. 67 to 68. And sometimes when I've talked to him about this and some of the other pilots that he was with um, at the time, they, they would share when they'd go into a hot LZ or when they'd go into an LZ and pick up troops, oftentimes they said if the troops came out of the, the US troops came out to the aircraft and they turned around to fire, it usually meant everything was going to be okay. It, they got worried when... When the troops are running out of the tree line, diving into the aircraft, getting ready to take off because they're like, somebody's right on their tail as that's happening. Uh, it sounds like you had a little bit of both with that going on. Well, we trained hours on that just because we never wanted that. I mean, when we went back, like when we were to the LZ, again, everything is depending on the timing. But we trained on how to get to because we were, we trained a lot with the king bee so it was one door on the right side of the yeah. helicopter and this day luckily it was a yui so it came in and our guys hit it 
And so um, Bubba and I were the last two to get on the helicopter because he had put another claymore out. And uh, I blew that, he blew one, and then we jump in the chopper. And as we're taking off, they were coming out of that jungle. You know, there's something to be said for the, it's almost the way that the special ops community does it today, where you work with the same aviation unit with like 160th. It's, it's like you had the same pilots who understood your needs, scheme of maneuver, that sort of thing, day in and day out almost. Yeah, and, and the, uh, fortunately, I mean, um, the Green Hornets, they were really good. They had the most powerful, the fastest UEs in country. I mean, what, what the Army, whatever the Army had, the Air Force was two steps ahead of them. And I remember, because when that, everything about it was more power. You could just feel it, it lifted off yeah. with authority. It carried a minigun with, you know, God, thousands and thousands of rounds for a minigun in a helicopter. Yeah. And, and they're, I think they were the ones that had the first minigun that they could move it more. It had more flexibility somehow. I forget what the, uh, what the nomenclature was on that, but they were amazing. And yeah, uh, awesome. yes, you're right. And the Kingbees were the same way. The South Vietnamese, man, when we were in the shit, they came. God. Well, so I don't want to take up all your time. I have no, a couple no, questions that I'm, I'm here on yours. No, I know. <laughs> I have a couple questions I'd like to ask everyone, yeah, please. but um, this is slightly aside the point. Do you have a photographic memory? Yeah, like the detail in the book is great. You're talking about things like by the day that you recall. Is that no. a strange question, but like you really do have incredible recall on some of these details. Uh, like everything else in Vietnam, I had help. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Fortunately, the majority of the people that we wrote about were still alive, like John Walton, uh, Hep, my interpreter, uh, was alive, and um, I um, Hep, I met Hep in 1999 or 2000, and uh, so that was 30 years in between. Visits. Wow. But Hep was around, and then of course Spider, Pat Watkins, uh, John McGovern was still alive, and all the guys on our team. So everybody Amazing. we wrote about, the majority of the people we wrote about, um, I could talk to directly. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Did, John, did you ever go back to Vietnam? No, no interest. If I was in Southeast Asia, I want to go to Echo 4 and see what it looks like. Yeah. Sorry. So would, what, what's the feeling there, your sentiment from it? Because I know for many vets of that time, it's, it's very hard to even go to the wall in D.C., let alone go back there. I mean, in your mind, what uh, what are your thoughts on getting back? Well, um, in my case, it was different. You know, we believed in what we were doing because of uh, all the people on our team. They knew that we um, we were fighting communism, and they knew their government was corrupt, but they preferred a corrupt government they knew to communism. Don't forget 1954, you had thousands of people that left North Vietnam to, yeah. to move to the South. Nobody in South Vietnam went North. And um, it was a fundamental principle of it all. A lot of our vets that were there um, never quite understood that or heard or, or heard, a, heard the story from Sal or Hep or Foucault, why they fought, why they were willing to die to fight communism. It's a form of communism, socialism, whatever you want to call it, world domination. They were very ruthless. And they kept yeah. coming. God. All right. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. I, it, it's, it's an interesting take. I know you did. It, it was two years that you ended up doing. Well, I, 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 my first tour of duty was April to April, April 68 to April 69. And then I went back in October of 69. I was there for until April 70. God. Got on my old recon team. And again, we go back to base. Okay, I'm in back at now it's CCN at Da Nang. It's 1969. I'm in on base a week. Gunther Wald and RT Maryland gets wiped out on November 3rd. Seven days later, RTS is wiped out. And God. and uh the members from that team, Walt's team, have now, they've all been recovered. 
and uh, properly interred in the United States. You know, uh, Wald, Brown, Donnie Shue. When we buried uh, Donnie Shue's remains in, um, it was uh, outside of Concord, North Carolina. When we went from the funeral home to the cemetery, guys told me that the that the procession line was 22 miles long. Wow. In North Carolina when he came home. I'll never forget that. And then um, RTS, you know, the two members of that team are still MIA. Randy Suber, his brother, and I become really good friends. Um through that whole loss, you know. So here we were back in camp, two teams wiped out Amazing. one year later. And um, it was, they were, they were, they had their act together. And after that, after your tours there, what's, what was your decision about? Like, do I stay in this, in the military and do this some more? Do I punch out? Like what went through your mind for that? Well, my time in recon ended suddenly when I ran into that, that colonel. Um, we'd had a discussion about, he was forcing a recon team to carry a, a, a scrambler. The scrambler was the same size, essentially, as a, as a PRC-25. So it had the same weight, same batteries, and you had to carry a huge key punch that was about over a foot long, and every day you had to do settings on it and then punch the settings into the scrambler device. And then that would enable the scrambler to give you secure communications. Well, when we first used those things, they never worked. And um, so I was gonna run a four man mission. And I said, specifically, I said, it's only a four man team. I don't want to carry the scramblers. No, I'm, a, I'm the Lieutenant Colonel. You got to carry it. I said, well, if I carry it and it doesn't work, I'm not going to bring it back. I'm going to destroy it in the field. So long story short, we're in contact. Oh, you'll appreciate this. So near the end of their gun runs, one of the A1s goes by and the, and the A1 pilot came by and as he did his gun run, he looked over at me. I saluted. I could tell you he was so close, he was smoking a Philly cheroot. <laughs> and during that time, while we were on the ground, and this was, it wasn't jungle. It was more like a lot of overgrowth, high grass, maybe some trees and stuff. We could hear the enemy looking for us. And at one point, I'm, I'm facing the enemy. I have my car 15 up on my hip, ready to go. And I, this face emerges from the jungle. It's a young kid, a young NVA soldier. He takes one look at me and stopped and just backed up and left. I don't have my car. If he'd done anything, I would have shot him, but he didn't. Wow. So this is my last mission. And so what happened was that damn thing didn't work. I hit it, burn it up, and uh, we got pulled out on a string. Now, we asked for an distraction because we made enemy contact. The commanding officer who ordered me to carry that, I can hear him flying in a CNC ship, a command and control ship, five, 10 clicks away. He refused my request to get pulled out. So we no continued way. to try to continue on, made a little bit more light contact. Finally, the Covey came back, ignored the colonel, brought in assets. He pulled us out on strings under enemy fire. We get back to base. He goes, where's my scrambler? So I said, it didn't work. Like I told you, I said, if it didn't work, I'm not going to carry that sucker. So he goes, how did you destroy it? I said, with a thermite grenade, put it on top. He said, you had a lot of smoke. I said, yeah, by that time, we made enemy contact. That's why I asked for an extraction. He goes, you know, I never agreed to you on those circumstances. He says, you have to leave, pack, pack your bags and get out of camp. I'm going to ruin your special forces career. So we had a few more words. And I told him he was a disgrace to the uh, West Point Academy. 
And I told him also, he said a couple other things. I told him he could go fuck himself. And that right there. Jesus. My command decision. I figured three and a half years. I had 19 months in SOG. My body was still pretty much in one piece. So I went, and what he didn't realize was, uh, because I came back in October, he thought I had a one-year tour of duty. I had extended to go back to Vietnam. And so my time in service was up in two weeks. So I went back to the train. I could have re-upped. I could have gotten pretty much any any opening. I could have gotten a job. But I figured this asshole put in my life just for me to get to get out of Nam. So I did two weeks of uh, guard duty in the train. Worked on my tan during the day. Oh, my God. But you know what? I, I did have one more traumatic event I had to tell you about. Please. The Viet Cong blew up our ice cream machine in our base. <laughs> now, the revs had to go downtown. They were traumatized. They had to go downtown for their ice cream, man. Do you know how serious that was? <laughs> so we came home, got out, and the rest is history. Oh, geez. Do you, do you wish that you had stayed in longer? Yes and no. When I see the, the uh, uh, how good Delta Force is today, the CAG units, with the 160th support, I mean, oh my God, what they can do at night. I would have run over your mother for one of your nogs. Oh, uh, I love how you talk about people having, I mean, you had some of the early sets of nods, right? Never. Some, of, some of the people, oh, I thought in the book, somebody else no, was we, out with them. Uh, what we had was a starlight scope. Okay. A long, Sorry, yeah. very heavy. No, it's okay. Yeah. And uh, so the first one was very long and heavy. And when you used it, of course, it ruined your eyesight at night. <laughs> And then they came out with a smaller one that fit on your, they could fit on your car 15. We I didn't want anything to do with it. It was just too much trouble because when it was on, it made a little noise. And then if you pulled your eye off of that eyepiece, it would just light up all around yeah. you green. So it's kind of, yeah, we'll just, we'll, we'll just stay up for, during the night, hit the RON and sleep a little bit rather than carry all that weight. And of course you needed batteries. So yeah, so you kind of wish that you you had stuck around with, under better circumstances. You could have seen yeah, that evolution. But you see, I mean, from 1970 until 1980, or 72 to 80, that was when they had those huge reductions in force. Yeah. Ru- yeah. Men who really wanted the career, who had planned on it, were just ruined. And special forces was devastated because the regular army back then hated special forces. They gutted it, knocked it down in size, and... Uh, but people like Eldon Bargewell and others that hung on got through that rough period of time and um, went on to become legends. Yeah. But it was tough. Well, I know you have a lot going on today and I want to get to that. So just these two questions and then we'll jump yeah. to uh, what you have happening now. One thing I like to ask everybody is, was there anything that you brought with you on your missions or your deployment that had either sentimental value to you it was a good luck charm, a talisman, or something like that. No, nothing. <laughs> no, no <laughs> time for that. I just, uh, you know, I, I think the only superstition I had was a, uh, I had a cravat, a, a cravat that I wore. And those are the green triangular bandages. And I had an old one. Well, it was old by the time I got done, but I always wore that just for a good luck charm. Yeah. But no, it's just, uh, I just wanted to get the job done. No time for that sentimental stuff. Do you still have that today? I got one somewhere. Yeah. That's I, cool. When we moved, I got it packed. I can't find it right <laughs> now. <laughs> Fair enough. And then uh, last question here is about the, the time that you spent in. And as you described it, 19 months in SOG, you stared down death so many times. And it, it's so well described in the book and the interviews you've done since. But looking at all that, all the pain you went through, would you have gone back and done that again? Oh, yeah, in a second. Because um, for me, the, the most painful part about it was leaving, leaving behind a team. Yeah. You know, that was the way things were set up. That was our rules. Um, I didn't like it, but I, I, I couldn't, I wasn't smart enough to figure a way to get around it too much. I could have re-enlisted, going to another CNC unit, but by that time, I've been on the ground 19 months with Idaho, Hep, Sal. And then even Hep left the team uh, in January of 70. He left because he'd been running missions for four years. He said, hey, uh, 
He had trained up another guy to be an interpreter. So we had a good interpreter and we had also trained, cross-trained a couple of other our indigenous troops. Uh, Hung could speak. Uh, he was coming along really well. Chow could talk English and they were working at it. And we also cross-trained them in radio procedures. We talked back and forth and then how to direct airstrikes in the event that we got killed or too uh, severely injured or wounded not to be able to direct airstrikes. So we trained those guys on that just in case. Yeah. So um, so Hep went up to the, uh, he got a, a promotion, big pay raise. God bless him. Go, man. Yeah. So we, I, I, my last three months in country were without Hep, but we had Sal. Yeah. And then we recruited Do T. Kwong, who had been with Lynn Black October 5th. He was one of the indigenous with him and Cowboy were the two stellar South Vietnamese that were with Lynn Black that day. And it's just amazing soldiers, just fearless. So- You'd have done it again is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, and I I was blessed. I mean, it's blessed with good little people on the team. They were fearless and the helicopter pilots. And yeah, 101st were there. And uh, the first Cav at different times, we had Scarface from the Marine Corps. I mean, in the early days of 68, they could barely get those old gunships off the ground. The, the, the crew chiefs would get out and run alongside the helicopter, wait till they got a little momentum up, then they'd jump back in just <laughs> to try to get, the, <laughs> the, get them off the ground before they got their covers. That's right. Oh, man. Well, I know you have a lot going on still, so could you share what you have in the works? Because uh, it sounds very exciting. Love to hear more. Oh, well, today is well, the, the most important thing. My wife and I um, have fulfilled the dream to get out of California. So we're now in Tennessee. That's the biggest thing. And uh, in fact, why we started a little bit late, because our, our grandson was here and we were just doing the moving stuff and the, the grandson. So that's the most exciting part of all. Um, you know, my wife was the one who encouraged me to write the book in the first place. The first time I wrote Across the Fence, we had four teenagers and a newborn in the house. And my wife goes, I believe in your story, write it. So I couldn't have done it without Anna. And uh, so we're here now. And so we're, we're moving to the next level. You'll be the first that I could publicly say that Jocko and I are working on an agreement where we'll begin doing SOGCAST. I think Jocko's gonna call them right. SOGCAST, where I'll be interviewing other SOG members. And then uh, Jocko will post them on his social media. And I'm really looking forward to it. We got uh, several men lined up. I could tease you with some of those. And uh, then we're also working with a company. This is top secret, but we're working on a, uh, a, a video game that's going to come out. Should be out before Memorial Day, maybe even before my birthday, which some would say would be April Fool's Day, <laughs> April 1st. <laughs> But it's going to be a video game. It's going to be based on SOG. And right now it's being, uh, it's being interpreted in seven different languages. And they have a staff of over 120 people working to produce this video game. So myself and Ken Bore, who was the last American 1-0 of uh, RT Idaho in 1972, we've been technical advisors. We brought in some more helicopter pilots, and a couple other recon guys that have been consulting with this and that we're excited about that coming out. And then um, I'll be working with the podcast and then get book four started. So we got uh, many stories that are SOG stories that haven't been told yet. Uh, Just in case people like myself who feel like we're busy, then we hear that and, uh, Clearly, you have so much going on. I'm curious if your wife asked you to write the book because she had heard you tell the stories too many times. And she's like, go tell them for someone else. No, you know, well, you see, in the early days of our marriage, it was like, um, what you do when you were in the army? Yeah. What'd you do? I was a Green Beret. Okay, well, we got four kids. What's who's going to cook dinner tonight? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we focused on our family first. So we didn't talk too much. And then. Over time, she met a few of my friends like Spider Parks, Eldon Bargewell, Doug Letourneau, the Frenchman, these characters. And each one would be like, just amazer. 
<laughs> and so they've all become dear friends and are part of the Sog family, you know. And so now she's familiar with the story. She's read all the books, of course. And um, she's just very supportive. So we're putting together a, a little uh, studio here. And I've lined up some of our Sog guys that have not been interviewed yet. That's great. To get them out there. And then you'll have some competition on the airway. Hey, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but it'll be a friendly competition. That's right. Jeez, John, thank you so much for the time, sharing all this, being so open. The book really is, I mean, I, I've just read Across the Fence. It's so well told, um, great detail. It really comes through. Highly recommend it. And best of luck with these other endeavors. Well, don't forget the second book, On the Ground. It begins with a recon team in our worst target. And the NVA came up, tapped him on the shoulder, says, your turn for guard duty. One of my all-time favorite stories. I failed to get it in the first book, so we let off the second book with it. It's and a great then teaser. Then the third book, Saw Chronicles, is the uh, we document one of the most successful hatchet force missions in SOG history, where the uh, 16 Green Berets, 100, 120 indigenous troops, went in to take pressure off of the CIA operation in Laos, deeper than ever, and uh, they were on the ground for four days. They had a successful intelligence coup. They took the pressure off the CIA. They killed thousands of enemy soldiers. And uh, the, the Green Beret medic received the Medal of Honor from President Trump on October 23rd, 2017, from that mission. Jeez. And from that mission, the 16 Green Berets received 32 or 33 Purple Hearts. The contact was day and night. God. And they were down there on the ground. They lost two CH-53 Deltas, shot down. And the second oh. one is a classic story where after being on the ground, they're launched as the last helicopter out. They're taken off. As they're taken off with all of the last men on the team, their intelligence reports that they got from the enemy, the first engine gives out. He climbed over a mountain. They get over the second mountain. The second engine goes out. And he had to auto rotate it for the first time. Oh, yeah. Oh. I know. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> Better you than me, man. That's right. Oh, jeez. <laughs> hey, that's a great plug. It's a great teaser. Um, thanks so much, John, for the time. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you. And thank you for your service, brother. I appreciate oh. it. We love our rotor heads. That's right. <laughs> thanks so much, John. Take All care. Right, Until next time. Take care. God bless. <laughs>